What's up, Hope? How are we? Good. Good to see you. Welcome to everyone joining us at all of our physical campuses. If this is your first week, we are in the fourth week of a series that we're calling Rhythm. And it's all about uh, taking the things that we do on a daily basis or a weekly basis or a monthly basis, taking the habits and the rhythms that are already a part of our everyday life and using them with gospel intentionality or for the purpose of sharing the love of Jesus and glorifying God in the lives of the people that God has brought to us. And uh, we're kind of confronting a myth in this series of talks. And the myth is that in order to make an impact, in order to make a difference in God's kingdom, in order for God to use me uh, to help transform transform other people's lives, I have to add a ton of different stuff to my already busy life, and that's just not true. And so we learned the first week that, you know, you eat 21 meals, not a day, I was going to say a day, maybe some of you do, but a week, right? And if you just take one of those meals and chose to invite someone that might be close to you but far from God, that God can actually use that simple meal as a gateway into their life and really change it for the better. And so we've talked about eating, we've been talking about serving or blessing. Last week, Leon, you guys enjoy Leon's? How can you not enjoy Leon's? Yeah. He talked about the needed rhythm of rest and of silence and solitude. And this week, it's an interesting topic. We're going to be talking about something that all of us do pretty much all the time. And we do it in better in certain areas of our life than others. And it's the rhythm of listening, of listening. It's going to be weird. I've never given a sermon on listening before. And the irony's not lost on me that I'm going to be talking for 25 minutes about the habit of listening. But that's okay. You guys are going to get some practice. Have you ever thought about... Um, how often you listen to things every single day. Like when you first wake up, I don't know if, uh, if you're like me, I ask Alexa to tell me what the weather is. And then maybe some of you head downstairs and you turn on Sports Center, or you turn on the local news while you're making breakfast. And then you get in your car and what's the first thing you do? You turn on your favorite radio program, maybe put some Spotify on. And then you go to class or you go to your job or you get to the office. And during the day, you might listen to some audio books. You might listen to some podcasts. And then you listen to the radio on the way back home. You listen to Netflix and YouTube before you go to sleep. And then some of us, like me, put on a white noise machine or a fan so that we can go to sleep at night, right? We listen to stuff all the time. But one thing that we do really, really poorly is listen to the other actual physical human beings that are in our vicinity, that are in our lives. We'll read the text message they sent us. We'll, we'll read their update on social media. Um, but very rarely do we listen and listen well to them when we're sitting at a table with them or when they're across the room. Rarely do we really listen to what they have to say to us. Most of us are really bad listeners. Anybody with me? I am. Uh, just this past week, my wife... Um, was talking and she said, have you heard a single word that I've said? And I thought in my brain, like, that's a weird way to start a conversation. Um, some of you will get that in the car. Because we're bad listeners, right? Uh, listening is an art form that a lot of us have forgotten. It seems like we're just so busy in our little world, just kind of building our own little kingdoms, just busy in the tasks in our own little universe that when someone asks us to put all that on hold so that we can listen to them, or worse yet, they ask us to leave our little world and to enter into theirs, that's a really, really difficult task. And we see the breakdown of this listening everywhere. I can't tell you how many marriage counseling sessions I've done over the years where she just doesn't listen to me, he just doesn't listen to me. Right? We see it in our parenting, when are you going to start listening? We see it in social media, um, and in politics, people just talking over one another and never just stopping and sitting down and not typing and not talking, but just listening to what the other person has to say. And I think a lot of what makes listening so hard is because many of us just like to talk. We just like to talk. You ever get in a conversation and you're just waiting for the other person to be quiet so that it's your turn to talk? Or while they're talking, you're planning out what you're going to say and not even listening to them, or worse yet, you just completely take over the conversation and they don't get a word in edgewise. Yeah, um, we love to talk about, especially ourselves. Scientists have proved this. Scientists have shown that there's a huge rush of dopamine that goes into our brain the moment we start talking about ourselves. In fact, it's the same amount of dopamine that you get from 50 milligrams of cocaine. Isn't that crazy? Don't do drugs, they're bad. But talking is like a drug that we've all become addicted to. Everyone's talking and no one's being heard. 
Well, what does the Bible have to say about this? And this series has been so cool because I get to take weird stuff like a topic like eating and now listening and really trace it all throughout the entire Bible. It's been pretty life-giving to me. But this week I learned so much. I was actually surprised at how central the the words listening and hear are to God's kind of storyline and actually how important of a virtue Uh, listening and hearing really is. The most famous verse uh, for Jewish people in the Old Testament and really for Jewish people today is Deuteronomy 6.4. It's called the great Shema. You ever heard of that? Uh, Shema is the first word. It just means hear. Uh, And so Shema, Israel, Adonai, Eloheinu, Adonai, Echad. That's what it is in Hebrew. You kind of got to cough when you say it. But it really means listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one or the Lord alone is our God. Um, One of God's great laments In the Old Testament, when Israel goes through these seasons of rebellion and unfaithfulness, he says, my people have closed their ears to me. My people no longer listen to me. And if you read through the New Testament, Jesus ends a lot of his most famous teachings with a very famous phrase, let the one who has ears, let them what? Hear, right? Let them listen. Let them take in this this information. Let them process it. Listening is connected to obedience all the time. That a good disciple or a good steward or a good servant is one who listens. A a, a qualification uh, to be a disciple is that we actually listen, really hear the commands and the desires of our master and then obey. That's why Jesus says, if they really are my sheep, my sheep know my voice and they listen to me. In fact, hearing or the act of listening, really listening, is uh, how we become Christ followers in the first place. You ever thought about this? Romans 10, 17, Paul says, so faith comes from hearing. That is hearing the good news about Christ. And so God wants his people to be known as good listeners. He wants us, he wants Christ followers to be known as people that, that hear well, that listen well, so that we can know his heart and know his desires and follow his lead. Um, and he wants Christians to be known as that. Have you ever heard someone say, uh, like, are Christians known for being good listeners in the world? I don't think so. You ever heard someone, well, I don't really agree with their politics, and I don't really like their beliefs, but dang if they aren't the best listeners I've ever come in contact with. No, it's usually the opposite. But it's not just himself that God wants us to listen to. He also wants us to be known as amazing listeners to other people as well. Uh, Perhaps the clearest verse on this is James chapter 1, verse 19. It'll be up on the screens. If I had like a verse for the, the weekend, it would be this. It's just one short little verse. Let me just read it to you. This is James, the brother of Jesus. He says this, understand this. He says, take note. I'm gonna give you some wisdom that you need to apply to your life. So write this down. My dear brothers and sisters, you must all, so he's including every single one of us. No one is is outside of this command. He said, you should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. That's it. That's all the scripture we're doing this weekend. You need to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. I actually looked up some of these Greek words this week. And I don't normally do that. If you don't know, a lot of the New Testament was written in Koine Greek, and that was my minor in college, but you can learn a lot. Um, this word that means quick, it's actually takus. It's only used one time in the New Testament, and it's here. And it has this connotation of like a quick bird. It means swift, or it means uh, without delay, or immediately, or right away. It's like, what does your hand do when you put it on a burner? It immediately jumps off, right? So he's saying that when you get in a conversation, any conversation with anyone, your number one priority, the very first thing that you should do, the one thing that you absolutely must do in any conversation is listen, is sit back. Okay, I'm in a conversation. Stop planning out what you're going to say. Stop waiting for a chance to speak. Just listen. And then when you think you're done listening, just listen some more. In fact, listening is one of the only things that you can't do too much of. No one's going to say, man, that guy just listens all the time, right? So he says you need to be quick, swift to listen. But then he says, but when it comes to speaking, you need to be slow. You need to be slow. And that Greek word, it kind of means, it has this connotation of unhurried or only do it after a, a long process of deliberation. And it's only used three times in the New Testament, twice here, slow to speak and slow to become angry, and another time in Luke chapter 24, and it's where Jesus calls these group of people, they're slow in understanding. 
they're not that bright. <laughs> when it comes to understanding, they're not that good at it. They haven't practiced it a whole lot. They're like a few eggs short of a dozen, right? And so James is taking that term and he's saying, when it comes to listening and speaking, you should listen a whole lot to the point where you're almost out of practice with speaking. That when you speak, it's kind of clumsy because you don't, you don't do it enough. You spend all your time listening instead of speaking, see? So we should be quick to speak, uh, quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Now, James applies this verse in the context of a relationship that's in conflict. If you read kind of the, the, the paragraph before and after, and that's great advice. Like if you're ever in a fight, first thing you should do is and just listen. Just listen for a long time. That can fix a lot of your woes. But it's also an amazing piece of wisdom if you're in a relationship with, not, not with someone that's angry at you, but when someone's going through a hard time or when someone's in need or when someone's going through this season of pain, it's, a, it's an amazing piece of wisdom to apply when you're in a relationship with someone that's suffering. In fact, um, I, uh, I went back to the book of Job. If you don't know, Job suffered a whole lot. So he lost his kids, he loses his physical health, he loses, almost loses his life. And um, he goes through this Im immense amount of suffering and then his three friends show up once they get word. And so his three friends, they, and as soon as they walk into Job's house, they actually just sit in silence with him for a long period of time, a matter of a few days, which I think is, is beautiful advice. In fact, a lot of times when I go to hospital visits, I don't say a whole lot. I just sit. I pray if they want me to, but that can just, that can just heal someone's heart. But then they were doing so good and they had to open their mouths. As soon as that period of silence is over, they go on these lengthy speeches, like pages and pages of advice. Here's what I would do. Here's how I would have handled it. Here's why you're in this suffering spot. Here's what you need to do better next time. Just, just line after line. And Job can't get a word out. And he, can't, his, he doesn't feel listened to. He doesn't feel like his, his heart has been heard. And when eventually those three friends leave, Job turns his head to heaven and yells, Job 31, 35, if only someone would listen to me. And that's the cry of our hearts when we're in a season of suffering. There's something powerful and almost healing that when you're in pain or when you're going through a hard time, someone just pulls up a chair and listens and doesn't try to fix it, and doesn't offer advice, just gives a listening ear. I mean, I'm sure all of us, think back right now to the last time that you really felt heard, that you really felt listened to. It might have been a week ago, it might have been 10 years ago, who knows. But I guarantee you can remember that moment because it's so rare. And uh, in fact, one of the biggest things that people in the Bible praise or worship God for in the Psalms is the fact that unlike all the other gods that are made up and don't really exist, the triune creator God, the God of the Bible, listens to his people. Psalm 116 says, I love the Lord because he what? He hears my voice and my prayer for mercy because he bends down to listen. I love that picture. I will pray as long as I have breath. This is David going through a really hard time. In verse three, he says, the, the ropes of death or the cords of death literally have, have wrapped around me. And he says, all the other people in my life, they're too busy for me or they're too busy talking and not listening. But the God of the universe, the God that created it and is sustaining it, when I talk to him, he stops and he bends down and he listens to what I have to say. Isn't that amazing? And he does that with you too. How cool is that? That the God of the universe that, that's keeping every single atom and electron like in its orbit and in its place. The moment you pray, it doesn't matter when you pray or how often you pray. It can be a dumb prayer like, God, please heal my dog's canker sore or something like that. God stops what he's doing and bends down and gives you his full attention and listens and really hears you. Doesn't that like warm your heart to know that? And the, the reason that it kind of warms our heart when we just hear that the God of heaven hears us is because I think we just know instinctively that being listened to, being heard, it feels a lot like being cared for. It feels a lot like being loved. In fact, David Augsburger, in this cool little book I found, it's called Caring Enough to Hear and Be Heard. It's out of print, but I think you can find it on Amazon. He says this, being heard is so close to being loved that for the average person, they're almost indistinguishable. And then Dietrich Bonhoeffer in his book, Life Together, which you should buy, it's easy to find. He says this, the first service that one owes to others in the fellowship consists of listening to them. Just as love for God begins with listening to his word, so the beginning of love for the brothers is learning to listen to them. It is because of God's love for us that he not only gives us his word, but also lends us his ear. 
So it is his work that we do for our brother when we learn to listen to him. See, listening is a ministry. It's a ministry. When I read all the scriptures, I can go on verse after verse after verse, but I kind of come to this conclusion. It's impossible to love well and listen poorly. It's just true, and that's so convicting because we can remember the last time that someone really heard us and listened to us. When's the last time your spouse felt heard? When's the last time your kids felt really listened to or your coworkers, right? So what, what makes this so hard? Because we seem to be really bad at it, even though it's so important. Well, I thought a lot about this this week. I think I wrote down a few ideas. I think technology is one thing. I remember growing up having random conversations in grocery stores, like life-giving random conversations with strangers. You remember that? Like waiting in line at Blockbuster and just having the best conversation with a new stranger and another friend. Like waiting in line at the dentist's office. Now everyone's got their face in their phone. Everyone's got earbuds in. My, one of my daughters is going through a headphone stage. Like I, don't, I haven't seen her ears in like three months. I have no idea. I don't even know what she's listening to, right? Um, I actually have this rule. Um, when I go to the gym, there's a few of you that I think frequent my gym as well. I don't go there as frequently as I should, but when I go, uh, I limit myself to one headphone gym day per week, and the rest I go without headphones. Because I would hate it if God wanted to bring someone that was hurting or someone that was suffering or even a church member that just needed some pastoral advice, and he wanted them to cross my path, but I was so busy like listening to Taylor Swift's new album that I missed that opportunity. Now, if a new Swift joint drops, I would probably choose that as my headphone day, but... Um, and that's because I, I've had gospel conversations in gym locker rooms before. I've had like life-changing conversations in grocery lines or, or gas, but it's just so hard nowadays because of technology. I think secondly for myself is selfishness, if I'm honest. Like I, I talked about this earlier, I, I'm kind of the center of my universe. And when I wake up in the morning, I know what it is that I have to do and I know what I really want to do. And I'm busy progressing my little plan and building my little kingdom. And when someone comes in and wants my attention and wants me to stop, like that's hard. Or what's really required for good listening is to leave my world and to enter theirs for an extended period of time. And that's hard. I think also for a lot of us, pride and shame is two sides of the same coin. And what I mean by that is that when, when us Christ followers, we get a little shaky in our identity and we kind of forget that our worth and our value and the reason that God loves us isn't based on anything that we do or don't do. It's completely based on Jesus. And it's not based on my performance, but on the performance of Jesus. When we forget that, you ever feel like you have to use a conversation to talk yourself up or to name drop or to make yourself appear wise or smart or funny or knowledgeable or the expert or spiritual? Henry Newman, he says this, and Henry, he's great, he, his books are awesome. He's kind of like this hippie Catholic, and you'll see it a little bit in here. But he says, to listen is very hard because it asks of us so much interior stability that we no longer need to prove ourselves by speeches, arguments, statements, or declarations. To, true listeners no longer have an inner need to make their presence known. They're free to receive, to welcome, to accept. Listening is much more than allowing another to talk while waiting for a chance to respond. Listening is paying full attention to others and welcoming them, welcoming them into our very beings. That's the hippie side. The beauty of listening is that those who are listened to start feeling accepted, start taking their words more seriously, and discovering their own true selves. Listening is a form of spiritual hospitality, I love that, by which you invite strangers to become friends to get to know their inner selves more fully and even to dare to be silent with you. And I love that point he's making, that silence is really a form of hospitality. Listening is a ministry. I, I counsel, I don't counsel a whole lot nowadays, but, and I'm not very good at it, but when the counseling seems to help the other person, it's when I listen for 90% of the time and then for 10% just ask good questions and pray at the end. And that's what I've been told good counselors do. And that really is what good counselors do. They don't, they don't really talk a whole lot. They just help the other person have a space to talk themselves and to figure out what's the root of this problem and maybe to even diagnose a path forward themselves. And what we see in our country is that people are willing to pay billions of dollars a year to these counselors and these therapists because they provide the needed service of listening. 
And what we see is that we could do that. We could offer free of charge what counselors and therapists do every single week. This week I read about a guy named Don Ritchie. And uh, he's known as the Angel of Sydney Harbor because for the past 50 years he's lived across the street from this rock cliff at the entrance of Sydney, uh, Sydney Harbor called the Gap. And um, people go there for the views and to take pictures all the time. But sadly, it's also one of the most popular uh, places uh, for suicides. And they go there and it's a quick kind of painless death. In fact, one person a week over the past 50 years has tried to commit suicide there. And um, Don Ritchie has sort of made it his goal to save as many people as he can. Authorities say he's probably saved about 160 people total, but his friends and his family members think that's probably more like four or 500. And here's what a news article said about him. It's a little lengthy, but he, he says this. How does he do it? What's his miracle method? Well, each morning as he gets out of bed, he looks out his window and throughout the day, keeping watch to see if someone's alone and close to the edge. And if he notices they are, he rushes out of his house to interact with the person. So in those bleak moments when the lost souls stood atop the cliff, wondering whether to jump, the sound of the wind and the waves was broken by a soft voice, and I'm not going to do an Australian accent, said, why don't you come and have a cup of tea, the stranger would ask. And when they turned to him, his smile was often their salvation. That's all he did. He offered them a cup of tea, a smile, and most importantly, someone to not just hear them and their pain, but someone who would really listen. And the article goes on and talks about this one woman that he remembers fondly. He noticed that she's kind of sitting out there and her purse is already beyond the fence. And he said, I just walked up and said, hey, you want a cup of tea? You want to come listen? You can meet my wife. And so she said, yeah, and went to breakfast and just had a chance to be heard until her heart kind of changed. And she said, okay, and she went home. And now she revisits every single year with a bottle of champagne just to say thank you. Uh, the article says, Don remains available to lend an ear, though he never tries to counsel, advise, or pry. I'm offering them an alternative, really, Richie says. I always act in a friendly manner. I smile. It's amazing what a simple cup of tea, a smile, and a listening ear can do for another person. While this cannot save everyone, which is true even for the Australian angel, it's true that simple kindness and a listening ear can be surprisingly effective. Crazy how powerful this is. And one thing you see all the time in the Gospels is that Jesus was incredible at this. We're going to see this next week. We're going to go in depth into two interactions he has with two very different people. But what you see in the Bible is that Jesus was an amazing listener. When he started talking with someone, he gave them the, their full attention. And he would give his attention to people that, that other people would talk over or would overlook. And it's actually weird that the, the Gospels go uh, to, to extremes to, to point out that Jesus looked people in the eye. Like that's in Scripture. And he would, he would ask these really revealing questions. And at the end, if he could, he would meet the need that they had. And then he'd go on about his day. It's what one pastor calls incarnational listening. And I love that phrase. Incarnation is just a theological word to describe how Jesus left his world of heaven and then took on human skin and came into our broken world. We talked about it two weeks ago, Philippians 2. And while he was with us, he sacrificed, he served us, he met our greatest need, the need for forgiveness and freedom um, and grace. And then once that need was met and the sacrifice was made, he left and went back to his world. And one pastor said, that, that's what good listening is. It's getting out of our little kingdom. It's getting out of our world. It's entering into someone else's, sacrificing like your time for 30 minutes, an hour, two hours, however long it takes. Seeing if there's a need that we can meet. Just trying to serve them by listening. And once we've done that, we leave and we go back to our other world. It's, it's incarnational listening. So what are some practical things that we can do? We're going to wrap up um, as we seek to, to use this thing that we do all the time, which is listening. We don't have to add anything to our schedule. What are some practical ways we can use this for the glory of God and the good of others? Well, I wrote down... I wrote down, I don't know, three or four. Um, if you just Google signs of a good listener, you can probably get 100 more. Uh, the first thing I would say is pray. Um, a lot of times uh, in between services or after services, that's when people really want to be heard by me um, or during the week during counseling. And so um, during these conversations, I'll just start with a prayer. Like I'll pray for myself silently. God, help me hear this person. God, help this person feel loved. God, help me hear the words beneath the words that they're saying. Help me find a way to serve them if I can at the end. 
So I would start with prayer. Second, I would say put technology away. Um, that means like when you're at a table with someone, it doesn't mean you put your cell phone right there. You know what that means? It means you're important, but if something more important comes along, I'm going to jump into that right now. So put your phone in your pocket. Turn off the TV. Take your earphones off. Guys, pause the video game. <laughs> now, wives, that's impossible if it's a cutscene or if there's an online tournament going on. So you're welcome, husbands. But put away the technology. Uh, thirdly, I would say body language is key. So I know when I'm out the atrium at a campus, um, I'll try to not cross my arms. This just comes across as guarded. Um, another weird thing that I do is I try to point both of my feet at them. And a lot of times someone will kind of get my attention in the atrium and I'm like this. And if you try to do a conversation like that, it's like, hey, I was doing something really important and you're not a part of that equation. So I try to point my feet towards them. I try to look them in the face or look them in the eyes. Don't glance all around the room. And some of you probably think I'm really rude because I've been talking with someone and you've tried to get my attention and I won't give it to you. I'll completely ignore you because they have my attention in that moment. And then lastly, I would say just, just don't feel the need to say anything, right? Be slow to speak. Don't listen so that you can give a good answer or a smart answer. Husbands, we've learned this the, the hard way, haven't we? Don't listen to fix. Might not need to fix. Well, why are we talking if you don't want to fix something? Because she wants to be heard, right? So just listen for the purpose of listening. Instead of saying, what do I need to say? Say, what do I need to learn? What do I need to understand about this person? so that I can love them, so that I can serve them, right? And there's probably a hundred other practical things. It's a little thing, right? It's something we don't have to clear time in our schedule for, but it's powerful. Um, back in 2016, we were planting our church in Asheville, and I would go prayer walking with a group of people at my church every Thursday afternoon, like old school, like door to door, Weird, huh? And so our church was in downtown, and we would walk through all the residential streets and roads, and we'd just pray for the city. If we saw someone on the sidewalk, we'd say, hey, can we pray for you? And some people would run away, and some people would say, yeah. And well, one time we met this lady that was the president of an HOA. She was actually in charge of this community organization for all the neighborhoods there. And I said, you guys have meetings? And she's like, we do. And I was like, can I attend one? And she's like, well, do you live in this neighborhood? And I said, yeah, and just lied to her face. And... Uh, <laughs> Rahab did it. It was fine. It's for God's glory. And so I go to this meeting and they have all these politicians there that are trying to get votes for the city council or something. I don't know. But I look pretty good going up after them because I don't, want, any, I don't want, any, want anything from you. Just want to let you know we just started a church and we're here to serve and bless you. And if you need anything, just let us know. And so that night, an older, about 70-year-old lady, sweet lady named Joan called and she had this house and had lived in this house for, I don't know, 50 years of her life, Asheville, born and bred. And um, she said, can you guys come paint my house? And I had never painted a house before. And I stupidly said, yes, we'll be there this Saturday. So you just go buy the paint and uh, get, get as much as you think you need and we'll come and paint it. And so I got 15 people. Her house was bigger than I was expecting. It's older. And uh, she want, the paint color she chose was purple. It was bright purple. And I said, did you mean to get it? She's like, yeah, I always wanted a bright purple house. So at the end of an eight-hour workday at Joan's house, we got about one and a half of the first coats done. And I realized I'm not good at painting houses. It takes much longer than I thought. So I had to finish this job myself. So I spent the next six or seven weeks, every spare moment I had going to Joan's house to paint this house. So much purple paint. And, uh, but day after day, she would just come out and she would just talk. And a lot of times it was just about her day. Then it slowly became about her growing up. Her husband had had an affair. He was still around. He smoked cigars in the back while we were painting. And, uh, her dad was a Baptist pastor. And I said, do you go to church anymore? She's like, no. My dad also had a few affairs on his wife. And so I don't, I don't talk to God. I don't go to church. I invited her to come to mind. She said, no. But I just listened. And then at the end of the day, when I was packing up the ladder, I said, hey, can I, can I pray for you? She's like, okay. So I prayed for her. Well, a few weeks go by, and she starts opening up more and more and more. And I start to hear about, man, the intense just racism she experienced in the city and I was really brought into this world that I knew nothing about. She introduced me to her grandkids and to her kids, and she started making me lunches and stuff when I was there. And at the end of this long, probably six-week process where I would just listen and I'd just pray, I was packing up. It was the very last day, and she said, Chase, can I talk to you? I said, yeah. She's like, come inside. So I went inside, and she said, I'm going to tell you something I haven't told anyone. I was diagnosed with cancer like a year ago, and no one knows, not even my husband. 
and they gave me this medicine, and I didn't like the way it made me feel, and so I can't really take that. Anyway, I just want to let you know something about you and the people that you're bringing, and you were praying for me like every day. I just want to let you know that I, I talked to God last week for the first time, and I've started praying again, and I've started looking at churches that I might attend. I just want to let you know. I was like, Joan, this is amazing, and I was crying, and I hugged her, and I prayed for her last time, and I didn't do anything. I painted a house purple very poorly. I had to hire professionals to fix all my mistakes. And I just listened and I just prayed. And God used it to work powerfully in her life, right? What does that psalm say? It says, I love the Lord because he hears my voice. We talk a lot about being the hands and feet of Jesus. What if we tried this week to be the listening ear of Jesus? I think God could use it. I do. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that you're hearing me right now. Father, would you bring, would you cause to cross our path people that need to be heard, that need to be listened to? Father, would you allow us to, to listen to those that are talked over or that are overlooked? Father, would you just create in us this habit and desire to leave our little world as important as we think it is and just go to someone else's? for a few minutes and just serve them. Show them that spiritual hospitality of listening and hearing. And would you use that for their good and for our joy and for your glory. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, just as a culture, we can all grow and learn more about just listening and having the margin to listen and uh, asking questions for empathy. One of my friends says whenever we ask questions, we should ask for understanding so that there's not an agenda behind it, there's just love behind it. And I really appreciate that, and I appreciate Chase for sure. Look, if this was beneficial to you, we would love for you to like or subscribe to our channel here, and that is a way that you can then take these links and share that on any digital platform, on your social media pages, uh, and we can reach the triangle and beyond through sharing these messages and things like that. Uh, and look, if you have any questions about Hope Community Church or how to get connected or what baptism is, anything like that, we would love to see you at gethope.net slash next. We love you guys. We will see you next week.